All right, time for another physics lecture. Um, this time we're going to be talking about energy. And one way of thinking about uh, this thing we call energy is sort of like the money of physics, or uh, the way the universe uh, keeps, uh, keeps the balance in the books. Yeah. OK. Um, up until now, we've talked more or less about things that are pretty concrete, things you can see, you can touch, feel, and that mostly falls in the category of matter, things that have mass. They're made up of atoms. Those atoms are made up of electrons and protons and neutrons. Um, so stuff like that. Okay. So it, as it turns out, the universe that we live in is composed of matter, for one, but also uh, this thing called energy. Yeah, we need to do this whole lecture to try to talk about what energy is and get some idea of what that is, so we're going to get there. So yeah, so mass is sort of like the substance of the universe. It's the stuff of the universe. So we see, smell, taste, touch. Um, it has mass, it takes up space. Right? Energy, uh, we can think of at one level, is like it's a, what allows the, that stuff to move and to do things. So we don't really see or feel any forms of energy, the biggest exception being uh, heat or heat energy, the flow of heat energy, but we'll talk about heat energy later on. But we don't really see or feel energy necessarily, but we usually notice or observe energy when it is uh, transported or being transformed from one kind of energy to another. That alludes to the fact that there are different kinds of energy. So let's talk about the kinds of energy. Oh, but before we talk about the kinds of energy, um, just a quick note, or a couple notes on why energy is a helpful thing. Um, at the end of the last lecture, I mentioned that uh, talking about motion or understanding the motion of things in terms of energy is sometimes easier or um, simpler. Again, this class isn't supposed to be about um, mathematics particularly, so we haven't looked at any real problems where you're trying to solve equations in order to figure out the exact motion of things. And if you were to do that, you would find out very quickly that using things like Newton's laws that have to do with force and acceleration and velocity, um, all those things are vector quantities. And uh, vectors are extremely useful. They're incredibly uh, versatile and used throughout mathematics. But if you don't know how to deal with them, then they can be difficult. And even if you do know how to deal with them, it can get very complicated. So in that way, motion is, in general, very difficult to uh, calculate. However, energy is, well, for one thing that makes it much more useful or much easier to work with than something like force is that it's not a vector. It's what we would call a scalar. It's a fancy word for it. But it's essentially, it's a number. It has a number quantity to it. Um, there's a certain amount of energy that an object will have, and there's no direction to that. You don't have to worry about any sort of directionality. And when you understand more about the kinds of energy and that the forms that energy, different forms that energy takes, then you can say a lot about what will happen to an object or how an object will move um, or how its motion will change just by looking at uh, the kind of energy or the kind of energy transfer that happens or transformation that happens and how much sort of that transformation is going to cost. So going back to energy, thinking about energy is like money in the universe. Okay. So the kinds of energy. Okay. In general, or broadly speaking, there's essentially two forms of energy. One, on the left here, is what we call kinetic energy. And very simply, kinetic energy is energy due to motion, or the energy of motion. So it's similar, in a way, to momentum that we talked about last time. It's not momentum, but it's similar in that it is a, a quality that an object has due to the fact that it's in motion. Okay. So any object that has mass and is in motion, and we learned last time it has momentum, it turns out it also has this other thing, sort of on top of or in addition to that, that is kinetic energy. So anytime an object has, uh, it has mass and is in motion, it has kinetic energy. That's it. Right? And again, energy is not a vector, so it has a certain amount of kinetic energy and there's no direction to it. 
right? You just say it has that amount of uh, kinetic energy. It turns out, again, heat is also uh, a form of uh, kinetic energy, or is kinetic energy in a way, too, but we're going to talk about heat more later on. So the other main category of energy is what we call potential energy. And this is, you could think of as the energy of arrangement, or um, sort of stored energy in a way. So objects have potential energy due to how they're arranged relative to other objects. And there are many kinds of potential energy. So examples are gravitational potential energy, having to do with how massive objects are arranged around each other. Um, there is electromagnetic potential energy, having to do with how uh, electrically charged objects are arranged around each other, and magnetic objects are arranged around each other. Meaning arranged, meaning you know, are they close together, are they far apart, um, that sort of thing. There is sort of spring uh, potential energy, also called elastic potential energy, uh, which is essentially the energy stored in a spring. When you compress a spring, uh, you're giving it some potential energy. Um, there is also nuclear energy, which is potential energy stored in the things made up, making up the nucleus of uh, atoms. There's also chemical energy or chemical potential energy, um, which is energy that's due, ha, due to do with uh, how uh, atoms and molecules are arranged around each other. Okay, so potential energy, lots of forms, but all about how objects are related or uh, are placed or arranged in relation to each other. And for the most part, I think in this uh, lecture, we're really only going to think about um, gravitational potential energy. Um, for one, it's sort of the simplest of them, and for another, we haven't really talked about any of these other things, um, and it's going to be a little while before we do. So, for our purposes, for this lecture, we're talking about kinetic energy, right, energy of motion, and potential energy, specifically gravitational potential energy. Ah, yes. So, for our potential energy example, again, just the gravitational potential energy, this is the potential energy or the stored energy that objects have, massive objects have, due to how they're arranged next to each other. So, for instance, I have a certain amount of gravitational potential energy right now because I'm in this position and because the Earth is where it is as well. If I climb up to the top of this building, I will have changed my uh, relationship to the Earth. Not a whole lot, but some. So I will have changed my gravitational potential energy as well. So that's the idea of changing how these objects are arranged changes their potential energy. And it turns out that gravitational potential energy um, is literally just the weight of an object in that gravitational field, whatever you're in, uh, multiplied by the height that that object is at. So if you take your weight, you multiply it by the height, maybe at ground level we call that zero. That would mean that at ground level or at sea level, uh, you have zero potential energy, and if I were to move up to the top of this building, I move up, say, uh, four meters, then I have my weight, um, whatever that is, multiplied by four meters to give my gravitational potential energy now. You know, I've said that there are co different kinds of energy, you know, the main kinds is kinetic and potential, but they're all energy, right? And being that they're all energy, we uh, can measure them all or quantify them all in the same way, and that is the metric unit for uh, quantifying energy is called a joule, or joules. And if you look at this equation, you could see another, uh, another way of looking at the units for our energy is the weight. Remember, weight in metric system is a newton. It's a force, it's a gravitational force pulling down. And height would be in meters. So a newton times a meter turns out it's the same thing as a joule. A joule is just shorthand for newton times a meter. Again, we're not worrying too much about units, but I wanted to point that out. So, a little sample problem here having to do with gravitational potential energy. So, if you have a bowling ball, it has a certain uh, mass, 6 kilograms, say, and just to make it simpler for you, I've already multiplied by that, multiplied that by 10 meters per second per second, the acceleration of gravity, to tell me that its weight is 60 newtons. Right? So, you have a 60 newton uh, bowling ball, and it's at a height of 20 meters. What is the gravitational potential energy of that bowling ball? And also, what is its uh, gravitational potential energy uh, when it's down at the floor? Zero height. 
All right. Well, hopefully, uh, you just took that weight, 60 newtons, multiplied by that height, 20 meters. You get 120 newton meters, newton, newtons, excuse me, newtons times meters, 120 joules. Same thing as a joule. So that's an amount of energy. Well, what is its energy when it's at a zero height or when it's on the ground now? Well, technically, it's you could say its height is now zero. So zero times 60 newtons would give you zero joules. So technically, you could say that this is zero gravitational potential energy. It turns out that potential energy in general is something that uh, has what we would call a sort of ambiguity in it, where what I actually call zero is a little, is in some sense, it's up to me, right? So, or it depends on the situation, which, what is convenient to call zero. So for instance, sea level might be useful to call zero, right? But if I'm in Denver and I'm already more than a mile up, it doesn't really make sense for me to keep saying that I'm already a mile up. I just redefine zero as being the ground level there, right? Um, and one reason why this is possible, or the main reason I guess why this is possible, is because in, in terms of potential energy of objects, you only really care about the changes in potential energy of objects. So I can tell you that the change from ground level from down here to up here is joules. It doesn't exactly matter that it's zero down here and it's 120 up here. I could have said it's 120 here, then it would have been up here. The, the important part is the difference is 120 joules. Okay, that was a kind of potential energy, to give you an idea of uh, gravitational potential energy. What about kinetic energy? And just to restate that gravitational potential energy is just weight multiplied by height, the height the object is at. Right? And again, that height is kind of ambiguous, but generally you just call it ground zero. It's, yeah, so remember, kinetic energy is the energy that an object has due to the fact that it has mass and it's in motion. And it turns out that the explicit quantitative form of the kinetic energy of an object is this. It's one half multiplied by the mass of the object multiplied by the speed of the object squared, or the speed times the speed. Right? So this is two factors of the speed of the object. The only uh, variables, the only things that really change to affect the kinetic energy of the object is its mass and its speed. If it's massive and it's moving, it has kinetic energy. And if it's not moving, if the speed is zero, then this side, of the right side of the equation is zero, that means the kinetic energy is zero. So a stationary object does not have any kinetic energy, or you say that's zero kinetic energy. And again, kinetic energy is related to momentum. It has to do, again, with objects in motion just as momentum does, but it's not momentum. So we don't want to get those confused together, right? This is what we call kinetic energy. Right, so this is kind of a re-examining of that same problem where, you know, I have my bowling ball, same bowling ball, uh, 60 newton bowling ball, uh, up at 20 meters. If I release it, it's going to fall to the ground, right? Gravity is, the force of gravity is going to accelerate this bowling ball down to the ground. Its gravitational potential energy will be decreasing, by the way, as it goes down, right, because its height is decreasing. But if I asked you, what is its kinetic energy just before it hits the ground, right, so as it, it's picked up all of its speed, it has a certain amount of velocity just before it hits the ground, it has mass, it has velocity, it has kinetic energy, what is that kinetic energy? Well, it turns out you could calculate that without anything else I've told you already, though you would have to go back to uh, looking at uh, objects in free fall and how far they move and how much their uh, velocity changes under acceleration or this constant acceleration due to gravity. And then you can take that velocity and essentially just the numerical value is the speed, you square it, you multiply by the mass, you multiply by one half, and you got the kinetic energy. Difficult. Well, come it's multiple steps, it's complicated, right? So there's a much simpler way where you only think about energy. We don't have to think about the acceleration that happens or anything like that. So what is that? Well, it comes down to another conservation law. So just as momentum is conserved when there's no external uh, forces that uh, act on a system, right? So remember we talked about collisions. 
when two objects come in and collide, they're gonna, if it's an elastic collision, they just recoil nicely, um, and the change of momentum is the same, so the overall momentum is conserved. There's no net change in momentum. So the same sort of thing, or the same conservation idea, applies for energy. If you have a system, and there's no sort of uh, external uh, things coming into that system in order to add energy or take energy away, then the total energy in that system is going to remain constant from one time to the next time, or from one time to any time later, right? So that's what this uh, conservation means. Right? So remember, it just means that it's staying constant over time. And in terms of energy, when we say that energy is conserved, we mean the total energy of an object, or of a system. But in particular, we're just thinking about a single object for now. So the total energy, right, because energy can be kinetic or it can be potential, so if you add those two together, that's the total energy that the object has. So whatever potential energy an object has, add its kinetic energy, that's its total energy, and that is conserved. That is going to stay the same from one time to the next. So this is more explicitly why I was saying that energy is sort of like the money in physics, and it allows for this sort of book you can to be done where you know you start out with a certain amount of energy, then something happens, um, and that energy may have transformed from kinetic to potential, or from potential to kinetic, but it's the same amount of energy in the end. So you can do a, a surprisingly a lot in, to figure out what sort of things going to happen afterwards. I realized I gotta jump back real quick because you might have caught it, but uh, I screwed up. I said part of this wrong when uh, it's calculating the uh, gravitational potential energy of this uh, bowling ball. And yeah, 60 times 20 is 1,200 joules, not 120 joules. I misspoke there. Okay, so then back to this uh, problem where we're asking what is the kinetic energy of this bowling ball just before it hits the ground. If it started up here at this 20 meters and you released it, drops down, uh, what's its kinetic energy? Well, now you know that the total energy of this bowling ball is going to be conserved, meaning whatever energy it has up here, it's the same amount of energy it's going to have down here, it just is going to transfer to a different kind of energy. Okay? So if we start up here with our gravitational potential energy, and again that was uh, 1200 joules of gravitational potential energy, we release it, it gets all the way down to the ground, or just before it hits the ground, it essentially has zero gravitational potential energy. And the conservation of energy means that all of that energy had to go to something else, and that something else is the kinetic energy of the bowling ball. Because right? now the bowling ball is moving, it has all this speed. So it had no speed to begin with. Zero speed means zero kinetic energy, but it had, uh, it was up at this height, so it had potential, gravitational potential energy. Now we release it, it gains this speed, but it's losing its, it's decreasing its height, so it's uh, losing its gravitational potential energy. Right? So this start up here with that potential energy, it transforms into uh, kinetic energy. So yeah, so this is sort of the big idea here in terms of energy and the reason that it's useful, that, that conservation of energy, the fact that the total amount of energy an object has is going to remain constant from one time to the next, or from one situation, or you know, time zero at a time, whatever. So yeah, so if we look at this situation, you know, if you have that six kilogram bowling ball, it's going to start out up here, as long as it's at 20 meters, a height of 20 meters, then it will have 1,200 joules of gravitational potential energy, right? That's the amount of uh, potential energy it has, because that's the how it's arranged around the Earth. It doesn't have any kinetic energy because it's not moving, you're just holding it up at this height. And then once you release it, that conservation of energy is telling you that that potential energy is, as it uh, increases its velocity, it's reducing its height. And so that you can kind of think about it as a flow of this sort of stuff where it's going from being a gravitational potential energy, or just a potential energy broadly, to a kinetic energy. And it's true whether or not it falls straight down or whether it goes along, um, rolls along on, uh, on an incline. Regardless, it doesn't matter. The fact is that if it starts up at this height, then it has that potential energy. 
it ends down at this height at the ground, it's going to have that potential energy has to have become kinetic energy in this simple situation. Let me say something in the next slide. Too. And beyond that, even, you know, we don't even have to look at just the top and the bottom, right? If we looked at uh, this space or this uh, kind of snapshot where the bowling ball is at has dropped from 20 meters to 10 meters, then the gravitational potential energy will have dropped in half, right? The height of it dropped cut in half, and the weight didn't change. So the potential energy cut in half to 600 joules. Well, where'd that energy go? It went to kinetic energy, right? So now it has 600 joules of kinetic energy. And you can play that game anywhere in the middle here. So that's sort of the big idea, is you have this energy that's sort of, that is a thing that an object has and allows it to, uh, to move in general, and that energy will transfer between different kinds, whether it's how it's an object is arranged around other objects, or how it moves. However, it's not always obvious where that energy went. So in the case of like a bowling ball, I keep saying that it's kinetic energy just before it hits the ground, because once it hits the ground, it, you know, it might bounce a bit, but eventually it stops moving. So it has no kinetic energy now, it has, it's not in motion, it has no kinetic energy. It's at a zero height, it has no potential energy, or gravitational potential energy. So what happened to that energy? It seems like energy wasn't conserved. So, good question, but it turns out that energy just transferred some elsewhere. And it transferred into, well, uh, heating up the floor a little bit, it transferred the energy of the sound that emanated from that, uh, those collisions or as it hits the ground. Yeah. So it might not seem when you, when objects collide, they will heat each other up. It heats the ground up, it heats the bowling ball up. And it might not generally think about it that way, or it doesn't seem like it, that does happen. Um, but for instance, if you've ever, you know, been hammering on something for a while, if you hit a nail, enough times, or a few times even, with some fast strikes with a hammer, and you feel the nail, the nail is hotter than it was to begin with, right? So the collisions tend to uh, heat the objects up too. And again, we're going to talk a lot more about heat later on in the next part of the course. But that is to say that just because you don't actually always see what where that energy went doesn't mean it wasn't conserved. It just means you don't know where it went, you didn't see where it went, or you didn't have, don't understand the kind of the other kinds of energies that could be there as well. Even in the case where it looks like this gravitational potential energy transferred to kinetic energy and then just disappeared, it didn't disappear. It became other kinds, another kind of energy. So that total energy in that situation uh, is still constant. That 1,200 joules of energy went into heating the bowling ball, went into making the sound of the crash. Heating the bowling ball in the ground. Okay. So now we're just going to look at I think a few couple examples of this conservation of energy in action and um, this sort of exchange of energy between potential energy and kinetic energy. And again, we're just really talking about gravitational potential energy. So one uh, example that's kind of the classic example of this exchange of energy is a pendulum. So a pendulum is just some kind of mass that's hanging on a string and that string is attached uh, at some point. So you take that mass well, to start out with, maybe it's just hanging straight down, it's not moving at all, right? So it has no kinetic energy, and we'll call that height, that's ground level. So it has zero potential energy too, right? So no energy here, right? So I actually have to, if I go to grab it, I'm actually inputting some energy in the system via my muscles moving it, but I put some energy into it in order to give it potential energy, right? So I pull it up to the side, I hold it there, I've increased its gravitational potential energy, it's gone from this height to a higher height, increases its uh, gravitational potential energy, and again, it still has no kinetic energy until I release it, and when I release it, that potential energy is going to start transforming into kinetic energy. Right? So it speeds up, right? As it transfers from potential to kinetic, it increases the velocity, and that ball starts moving, but it's connected to this string, so it moves on this curve. And right here, as it keeps moving, it hits the bottom, bottoms out essentially at the least potential energy again, right? So that's kind of our ground level. So now it has no potential energy and all of that potential energy I gave to put it up here, or it started with up here, is now kinetic energy. Meaning that this is the fastest place that pendulum is moving. 
All of that energy is gone to kinetic energy. But it will continue moving, and then it increases its height again. So that means that its potential energy is increasing again, and that means its kinetic energy is decreasing. So that kinetic, it gone, it's gone from potential energy to all kinetic energy, and now going back from kinetic to potential, it can only go up to the same height that I pulled it up on the one side, because that's the same potential energy. Right? Same height, same amount of mass here, so the same potential energy. So that's why a pendulum, when you release it, it's going to drop down, and it's going to go this up to the same height as you released it on one side, come back and be the same height as you released it on that first side. Right? Because it's that's the same gravity. There's only that amount of energy in that system. It can't get more and go up any higher. And at that side, when it gets all the gravitational potential energy again, it stops moving. No more kinetic energy for a split second. And then it starts moving back again. It increases its kinetic energy and decreases its potential energy. And you get this continually back and forth motion, of essentially like a seesaw of energy kind of ping-ponging between uh, potential and kinetic energy. But again, this is an example where that the sum of those two remains constant. So if we have whatever the amount of potential energy is when I first pick it up, that's all the energy it has. So when I release it, it can only go so fast, given how high I picked it up to, right? So it's going to get to a, a peak speed where all of that potential is now kinetic energy. And then all that kinetic energy is going to, again, transfer back to potential energy. And that is the same amount of energy as I started with, so it's going to have to be the same height. Again, this is an example where I'm telling you in the ideal case, but in real life, there is air resistance that is uh, acting as a force, so it's uh, essentially taking energy out of the system. There's also a bit of friction, maybe, in the way that the um, string is moving. So there are things that slowly dissipate the energy in that system, and so overall, the um, height of the pendulum comes down further and further and further, and eventually just stops moving. Right? But it's never just spontaneously going to go higher than it uh, started, at least. So you might have seen this sort of example where you take a pendulum, a big pendulum, usually like a bowling ball or something like that, and put it up really close to your face, or somebody does, and release it. And like I told you, it's never going to go higher than it started. So it goes, swings all the way out, and it can be very, seem very, uh, maybe pretty scary, but it's going to come back and come back to essentially the same spot as it started, or maybe slightly lower, because again, because of air resistance and friction. So let's see an example of that. So release the bowling ball. Comes back, same height. Nobody got nothing mattered here, right? Ah, uh, but then he moved into the lake. Yep, don't do that. So just to be clear, it wasn't the pendulum's fault there. The pendulum wouldn't have hit him if he stayed still or just moved out of the way instead of into the way of the pendulum swinging. Okay, so another sort of uh, place where this conservation of energy and exchanging of potential energy to kinetic energy is useful or can, sort of can be seen is if you are rolling uh, balls or uh, hoops or whatnot um, down different tracks. So essentially you can predict the speed that these balls are going to go or how they're going to be related to each other just due to the uh, fact of where they started, how high they started up. Right? Because where they started down on these tracks, you're going to like take these balls and you're going to hold them uh, up on some slope Right, on these slopes, and you're going to release them from there. So they start out with no kinetic energy. The only energy they have is their potential energy, their gravitational potential energy. So given how high they are up, that's the amount of energy they have. So with that knowledge, you can say something about how they're going to be moving as they fall down and keep moving along these different tracks. And we can, you know, like I said, the that change in potential energy is really what's important, but if this bothers you as thinking of one on top of the other, uh, just think about them. I think in the video, there's just side by side, right? So it's literally starting at the same height, coming down a bit on the slope to the same height, right? So they start up and they drop down uh, and hit that first uh, flat spot, right? So since they both change from this, this one height down to the same amount, or they move down the same amount, they change their potential energy in the same way, that means both of them will have the same kinetic energy and they're both going to be moving at the same speed. However, in track B, that track drops down again. So what happens is it's decreased its potential energy again, right? It's decreased the height again, so it's decreased the potential energy again. So that energy had to go somewhere again. It goes into uh, moving that ball faster, more kinetic energy. 
So when that ball in the track B drops again, it's going to be moving even faster than uh, the ball in track A. And then finally, when it comes back up to the top again, it's going to increase its potential energy the same amount that it decreased as it fell down, because right? it's the same height change. So it's going to be back to the same kinetic energy as well. So right as it comes back up off the top, it's going to be moving again at the same speed that the uh, ball on track A has moved the entire time. The two tracks. So in slow motion, right, as it drops down, it speeds up. And then as it uh, comes back up, it continues in the same way. So pay attention to the fact that the ball, when it drops down, goes faster, but then comes back to being at the same speed, the same kinetic energy, and when it comes back up to that same level. And again, our eyes aren't very good at judging velocity, but it's the same velocity. Okay, so I think the last, or one of the last final things in the end of this lecture is going to be how energy is related to something called work and a little bit beyond that, something we call power. So work is a term that we used for an amount of energy. So work is, uh, it's telling you about a certain amount of energy. And particularly it's the amount of energy you expend to move an object. Or to, you could say to change how an object is arranged with respect to other objects. So when you say how much work uh, you're doing, you say, or work, at least in physics, we say you do, you're doing work on an object, right? So if I'm picking, say, picking up a crate or picking up a bowling ball, I'm doing work in order to move that bowling ball to increase its gravitational potential energy. And that the change in that gravitational potential energy, that's the amount of work that I'm doing, right? So there, it's just a measure of energy that's kind of expended to do something. So it turns out that one way of looking at it Work is going to be proportional to the force that you apply to an object in order to change how its position. And it's also proportional to the distance that you move that object, or the distance that that object is traveling in general. And finally, it turns out work is just those two things. Work is the force you apply to an object multiplied by the distance that object, that, that object will move. Yeah, so work well, it turns out it's it's just energy. It's not so it's not a vector again, and even though it's not a vector, it's still a number, and that number could be positive or negative, or it could be zero. And it turns out if you are essentially think about just applying a force to like a crate again to say like um, or a bowling ball to pick it up, I'm applying a force. I uh, use my muscles, my skeleton, whatever. Applying a force to the bowling ball in order to lift it upwards, right? So the force I'm applying is upwards, the uh, direction that ball is moving is also upwards. So that would, that's a positive amount of work that I'm doing there. Uh, work can also be uh, negative if you're actually applying a force in the opposite direction that, that, that an object is moving. So for instance, slowing an object down. If a bowling ball is dropping, I'm trying to catch it, then I'm applying a force in this direction, the upward direction, but it's moving downward. That would be a negative work that um, and the work can also be zero, and it turns out that if you apply a force to an object, but it's perpendicular or at a right angle to the um, the way the object is moving, then you're going to do, uh, you'd say you do no work on that object. There's zero work being done, right? So I think there's an example of that one coming up soon. So. Yeah, okay, so let's try to check yourself on um, at least when you do work or when a force does work or something does work on an object, is that uh, object or that work being done positive or negative or uh, zero? So in this case, we have some uh, some prisoners with jobs and they're pulling a, a heavy load in this picture in Egyptian times, maybe trying to make a pyramid that I don't, the brick is on. So if we look at sort of a um, kind of abstracted or idealized version of this picture, we essentially have this sort of picture where there is that load, maybe that big stone, and the workers are essentially pulling uh, one way, and so they're applying a force in that direction. Friction is applying a force in the opposite direction.
All right, well, let's look at, so first, the prisoners with jobs are pulling, right? So they're applying this force um, to the left, uh, uh, the right, sorry, backwards, uh, pulling to the right, assuming that that block is actually being dragged to the right. Yeah, the block being dragged to the right. Then they're doing uh, work, or they're applying their force in the same direction that the object is moving. That's positive for some positive amount of work. Um, the friction, however, is actually applying a force in the opposite direction, right? So the object's moving this way, the friction is acting in that direction. We would say, so that's opposite direction of motion, that's negative work, or some negative amount of work. And then finally, the ground is applying the force upward, but that is exactly perpendicular to the direction the object's moving, right? So the object's moving left to right, the support force is upward, that means that's zero work that the, um, the support force is doing, the ground is doing in holding this object up. And in a way, you can see that as, you know, the, that support force is there, but if it's going to change the energy of that object, then it would, it would be changing its potential energy, it would be moving it up or down somehow, but the object's not moving up or down somehow, so there's no sense that there's energy that's being input into that system by the ground. No work being done. So, you know, you can do uh, work in different uh, sort of ways, right? You can, in like in this picture, you can take a stone or some kind of block of something, I don't I think it's supposed to be a stone, and I can change that stone's potential energy, its gravitational potential energy, in a variety of ways. For one, you could just simply pick the stone straight up, right? So you have a person picking the stone straight up, and... Yeah, you change this potential energy from zero to whatever it is now. Some is that some height, that's some mass, or some weigh something. So it's uh, that's its gravitational potential energy now. Um, on the other hand, you could take that stone and you could push it up a, a a plane or like a slope, right? And that way, you're still changing the stone's height by the same amount, so you're still getting to the same gravitational potential energy. But these situations are uh, well, different ways of essentially accomplishing the same uh, thing. And in terms of the work, the work is just the amount of energy you put in in order to change an object's, this object's arrangement, in this case, just picking the object up. So the work that each of these people are doing is the same, right? Because they have, they're changing the object's energy by the same amount, that's the same amount of work, work being done. In the case of the person picking the object straight up, they're essentially exerting a large force um, over a shorter distance, right? Because remember, work, at least uh, the amount of work done, is force multiplied by the distance that force uh, is applied over. So big force over a short distance can give the same work, or is equivalent to the same amount of work, as a smaller force over a longer distance, right? This person's kind of going along the hypotenuse, longer than this, arm, this side of that triangle. So, each of them are doing the same amount of work, but they're doing it in different ways. And it's the same amount of, it has to be the same amount of work because they're getting, they're changing the object's energy by the same amount. Oh. And so before we move on, the last concept is power. And power is something um, that is more sort of relatable or something we utilize a lot more in, sort of in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, so. Again, like in this situation, you have the same amount of work being done, right? However, depending on the person or the amount of time that these things are done over, one of these people might be exhausted, right? So that more physiological feeling um, of exhaustion or how much uh, energy you feel like you put out um, or what this kind of effect of it is on your body has more to do with the power that's being uh, put out by each of these people. So what is power? Well, jump to the quick here, it turns out power is essentially the work done over a certain period of time. So work divided by a period of time. So thinking about it, if you are doing, if each of those people is doing the same amount of work, uh, right, the one person lifting the thing straight upwards, uh, exerting a large amount of force over that shorter distance, they got a certain amount of work versus the person that's pushing the rock 
the thing up the slope, you have a much uh, smaller force over a longer distance. Same work, right? But the person who just lifted the thing straight up did it in a much shorter amount of time. Right? So in this equation, a shorter amount of time with the same amount of work, right? the denominator is smaller, that means it's more power being output. So the person that just straight lifted that block up is exerting, is outputting a lot more power and will probably be, um, likely be more tired by doing that, right? Because our bodies essentially run, are more interested in the power outputs than exact work. So the other person is, you know, again, the same amount of work, but a uh, longer time, so a larger denominator, lower out power output. And, um, you know, another example of this is if you say walk upstairs versus run upstairs. Everybody knows if you run upstairs, it's going to lock, it, it's a lot more tiring than if you walk up those stairs. But that doesn't have to do with simply the amount of energy you put in, or the total amount of energy you put in, or the amount of work that you did to get yourself from the ground to some height, right? So you changed your gravitational potential energy. You had to do work in order to change that energy. You put in the same amount of energy overall because all you did was change your height by the same amount. You went up one flight of stairs, That's the, it takes a certain amount of energy to do that. There's nothing that's gonna change that. The thing that does change is how quickly you do that, uh, you put in that work. So if you run, you go very quickly, short amount of time, larger amount of power output. Versus if you walk, you go very slowly, long amount of time, uh, lower or smaller amount of power output there. So another way of saying power is essentially a measure of how fast work is done. You could also say how slow, but the, sort of the rate at which work is done. Yeah, okay, so let's try to wrap this up with a little, uh, some questions. And these ones might be, might be a little bit tricky, I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe not. So uh, hit pause hopefully and Try to fill in, sort of fill in the blanks here and answer this question at the end. Take as long as you want, but you know, don't take too long, take a minute or two. And if you don't get an answer, you don't get an answer, it's fine. Be back in a second. Okay, so let's look at each of these things, right? You have a um, set of cars coming to stops or coming up to stoplights. Um, well, all right, so first off, we have a car, and it's going at 30 miles per hour, right? This is the speed, versus that same car going 60 miles per hour, double the speed. So the 60 mile per hour car turns out it's gonna have four times the kinetic energy. And the reason being is you go back and look at that uh, equation for kinetic energy, the kinetic energy was one half the mass of the object multiplied by its speed squared, or its speed times its speed. So if you double the speed, then you essentially get a factor of two for, or you get two factors of two, one for each of those speed things in there. So two times two, four times the kinetic energy, or two squared is another way of saying that, four times the kinetic energy. So if an object, if you, or your car has four times the kinetic energy, right? The one going at 30 miles per hour has a certain amount of kinetic energy. The one going at 60 miles an hour has four times the kinetic energy. That means it's going to take four times the work to stop the car, right? And the, again, remember that work is the amount of energy you put in to change an object's uh, motion or to change its uh, position, right? Or how it's arranged. So in this case, we're going from an object with uh, a certain kinetic energy and another object with four times that kinetic energy, right? Either way, they're going from that amount of energy, whatever they have, to zero. So you just have to put in the same amount of work as there is kinetic energy there. So if, it's, if the kinetic energy is four times, then the work needed to stop that kinetic energy or to arrest that kinetic energy is also four times. Well, what does that mean in terms of brakes and braking distance? Well, if you, assuming you apply the same amount of force to brake uh, on the brakes for each of these uh, situations, remember work is equal to force multiplied by the distance that that force is applied for, 
So if the force being applied is the same, it's the same braking force, and the work to stop the 60 mile an hour car is four times, that means that the distance to stop that 60 mile an hour car is four times as well. Right? So this is getting at the fact that when you increase the speed of a car, it doesn't just uh, directly or proportionally increase the distance it takes to stop that car. It actually goes up as the square of that speed because of the fact that kinetic energy is or comes uh, is calculated from twice or two factors of the speed or the speed square. And finally, how much gravitational potential energy does the car have the whole time? Well, assuming it's a flat road, it was zero. It's always at the ground level, so we just call that zero. Alternatively, like I said, it's kind of arbitrary what you call zero, but the key here is that the gravitational potential energy didn't change. So you could even say it was, it started out, you know, over there with 12,000 joules gravitational potential energy, still 12,000 joules gravitational potential energy. As long as the height didn't change, gravitational potential energy didn't change. But generally we call ground level zero, so let's just say zero. Zero there, zero over here. Okay, um, that is it for the lecture on energy. Again, uh, energy is a very powerful and uh, widely utilized tool in physics and also in other uh, sciences as well, chemistry and biology. And yeah, just understanding the concept of energy and kinds of energy can make understanding what a, an object will do or how it will change its motion um, in any given situation, it can make it much easier. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed that, so I will see you next time.